they don't want you to go to polemical in your seminaries and your Bible schools because you get death threats. Yeah. So this is the only religion that will kill you for what you say. The atheists aren't going to kill you. They're not even going to threaten you. They're going to sit there and laugh just, at you. They just try to, to sue you. That's right. Or they'll har harass you. Or yeah, they'll, exactly. They'll, they'll add, use ad hominem. But that's about it as far as they go. The Muslims will kill you. And you can see this with Salman Rushdie. Look, at they're still trying to kill him just for writing one book. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debates, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're gonna be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. I am so pleased to be sitting here with my friend Jay Smith. I've known Jay for Forever, I think pre 9 11, actually. And uh, Jay is a uh, is an Islamicist, and mm. um, I've been following his work and engaged in it to some extent um, over you know the last couple of decades. Jay, delighted to have you. Well, Larry, it's always good to be here. It has if if you define time as before or after 9 11, that's <laughs> fascinating because. Yeah. That's pretty much what our ministry has had to do. We've had to define time, what uh, before and after 9-11. Is, it was Changed a watershed, watershed moment uh, in American history, in the history of Western of the Western world, but particularly in, in your world. Why don't you tell everybody what a what is an Islamicist? Right. Well, it's a an Islamist is an expert from an Islam from a, a Muslim expert on Islam. An Islamicist is an expert from outside of Islam. It's as simple as that. And that's what you are. You got a PhD in? In Islam. I've got a PhD in, in apologetics and polemics of Islam. I think I'm the first in the world to get one of those. I got a master's degree in Islamics and another one in, in, um, uh, in apologetics. How does a guy get into a world like that? I well, mean, you don't. You don't you're the you, only guy I know who does this. And there, there's probably a reason for that because of where I grew up. I grew up in a Muslim context most people, when you think, when you say Islam, you think of the Middle East, you think of Saudi Arabia and all that area of the world, and they say, and that's why here in America, especially, almost every conference you go to that's on Islam is about the Arab world. But the Arab-speaking world, or the Islamic Arab-speaking world, only makes up about 15% of all Muslims. The vast majority of Muslims are Asian, where I grew up, and places like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So I grew up in India. My parents were missionaries there. My grandparents were missionaries there, all in the Muslim area. So I have, I have had roommates that were Muslims. I have classmates. And in that type of environment, because I'm so used to it, I don't have a fear of Islam like I see many Americans do. And also, I really understand the pulse of it. So in some ways, the Lord prepared me to, to be in this world uh, just because of the environment that my parents were in and grandparents. Uh, so you um, you evangelize and um, debate Muslims, don't yeah, you? Yeah, no, that's that's something that came much later. When I came to the states, came for my undergraduate, and then I and then I didn't went on for my postgraduate. It was while I was doing my postgraduate that I was just going to go 
into theology, and especially apologetics. But when you learn apologetics here in the United States, or even in Europe, you learn apologetics on how to defend against the atheists or the humanists or, or the Jehovah Witness, maybe the Mormons, but not Islam. There's no course that teaches you on how to defend yourself against Islam, which is rather ironic when you stop and think that it's, it's soon to overpass Christianity as the largest religion on earth in just about another 30 years. And it is the only religion that I know that's really confronting us head on at our foundations. It doesn't stay still. So there's no class that teaches you how to defend against these attacks. Payne and I are, well, we're old friends. There I am in the street, bleeding out. My jaw was split. My face was broken here, here, and here. 41 broken bones and more than 51 fractures. I wasn't expected to live. Those who struggle with the idea that God allows suffering usually do so because they begin with a flawed assumption about God and His purposes. They assume God is most concerned with our comfort. He isn't. I'm Larry Alex Taunton, and along the way, I've learned a few things. The reality is nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in this life that he does not cause or allow. So the question becomes, why? Why does God allow suffering? Our Lord told us that we will face tribulation, pain of some kind. For some of you, it will be profound. Now that might unsettle you, but I would have it no other way. My life is in God's hands. I believe he has a right to do with me whatever he wants. And if that means to break me like a brown stick, he has the right to do it. Time to prepare, not in the midst of your suffering, but before you get to your suffering. I'm providing you insights from scripture, insights from real life that will give you something to hold on to when those storms break against your life. I look forward to telling you about what I have learned in my course, The Paradox of Pain. And uh, so it was when I went to London, and we were called to go to London to work there because there is a radical form of Islam. We'd been in Africa and in Senegal for five years, much more of a Sufi overlay of Islam. They are having a problem in London. And the reason uh, they're having a problem is if you know anything about the British colonial system, of course, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh were colonized. And these are three of their best. It was all one, in, uh, one colony called India. It's the golden crown of, of British The colonial. jewel of the crown. The jewel yeah. of the crown. And so, there were the largest populations of immigrants or people who came to Britain were from these countries, but the majority of them, 70% of them, were would be Muslims. Hindus, no, but Muslims, yes. The Muslims that came were much more radical than anything that I have seen anywhere in the world. And it's, it was their, the churches were having difficulty with these Muslims because they weren't just, they weren't Muslims who stayed in place. They were Muslims that were coming to the church and confronting people in the pews. They were confronting, especially on the university campuses, going into the Christian unions, and actually they were going up to the leaders or they're staying and waiting in the uh, meetings and putting their hands up and asking very disturbing questions about the Bible and about the Trinity, about the divinity of Jesus, the, 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 the questions like this that many of the students had, didn't know how to answer. And so they asked me to help out in this area because I had already had a degree in, in, in Islamics and I had a degree in apologetics. Perfect for me. So I started going to the campuses all over Britain. Well, I lived in London. <clears throat> London had about a million Muslims at that time. Uh, in that time, there, in 1992, there were about 10 million people living in London. So you're talking about a tenth of the population was Islamic, almost all from the Indian subcontinent. And in the universities, they were dominating the, the Christian unions. They were coming into the Christian unions. They had the Islamic societies, they call them. These are the equivalent to the Christian unions. And they were challenging the Christians to debates on subjects that only had to do with Christianity. Attacking our Lord, attacking his divinity, attacking our scriptures, things like that. The Pauline paradigm and, and such not. And so they needed help. The students needed help. Well, I said, I'll help you. This is my area of expertise. But it was about that time, Larry, I, I knew a place called Speaker's Corner. 
you've been there, and uh, With you. I, I've grown up Many hearing times. about this place. Well, what is it about Speaker's Corner that's so unique? <clears throat> I mean, you know, when you heard about it, what did you know about it? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I was partially educated in London. I've been going there for quite some time. Speaker's Corner has such a robust tradition of oratory yeah. that goes back, you know, uh, centuries. Yeah. And a uh, place of execution, you know, That's where right. people were given an opportunity to say their last words, you know, perhaps quite literally on a soapbox and and speak to the crowds just before their, their execution. But that continues to this day in a country where free speech really isn't a thing anymore, but it does it does still kind of exist in Speaker's Corner. People gather there on Sunday afternoons, and you can go down there, and you might hear one guy who's shouting death to America and burning a flag, and the next guy might be telling you, how to become a millionaire, but I, I think it's a it's a place that to many Americans feels a little weird, you know, because they think this is sort of a freak show that's going on down there. But the there a, a tradition of oratory is very real throughout the Islamic world. They they value these kinds of exchanges, mm -hmm. and they gather there, and that's a place where you go. Well, I didn't know that when I first started, and I, I, was, I went there in 1992. And I noticed what you do today, back to this, you're right, it was soap boxes during the time of execution. Now they use these little kitchen ladders, just two steps, so you can get your head above the crowd. You have to have a head of the crowd so you can create a crowd for yourself. And there are two things to create a crowd, either be controversial or be funny. Not too many Muslims are funny, but they are controversial. And so... When I went down there in 92, they dominated the corner in the afternoons. And they would come with Bibles. They would always have Bibles, but oh, no Qurans. Carefully Qurans. marked. No Qurans. Yep. Always Bibles. Yeah, they were always polemical. Yep. And for those people who don't know what that word means, it means to go on the offense. Yeah. Apologetics, defense, polemics, offense. It, with words. To go to war with words is really how it's defined in the dictionary. And so they, would, they were brilliant at polemics. And they were always attacking Christianity. So I was down there to see what was happening. And, and making I, converts. Absolutely. Every week. And on any given Sunday back in the 1990s, there would be about <clears throat> 10 or 15 ladders where Muslims would be on the ladder, and they'd have their talibes all around them, their disciples. Some, and all, sometimes, sometimes in Arabic, but almost always in English. I would go into each one of those groups and I would try to muscle my way up towards the ladder and then I would try to throw questions at them and I got beat up. I mean, it was back in the 1990s, they were not a religion of peace back then. This is pre 9-11. You were beaten up physically. <laughs> physically and, beaten yep. up. I got my glasses broken, I got knocked to the ground, I would come home sometimes with bruises all over my midriff where they pinched me, things like that. And uh, it was hard to get any word out and I realized that I was overwhelmed myself because I hadn't heard this kind of polemics. They were attacking, the, they were, they, that's right, they would have Bibles, little post-it notes with all the seeming contradictions and the supposed historical anachronisms and the scientific problems. I had never come across this. I was never taught this in seminary uh, because there's no, there's no place in the world that does teach you this to prepare you for this kind of uh, confrontation. I remember the first week I came back uh, to my wife and I said, I'm never going down there again. I never felt so humiliated. Well, she kicked me out the door the next Sunday. It only happens on Sundays. <laughs> and says, get back on the horse again, Jay. This is the best way to learn it. Take a little notebook with you and just write down every, one, every question that you don't know and just tell them, give me a week, give me a week. Well, this is before internet. This is before Wikipedia. This is before any of the helps that we have today. So I would come back and I would have to go try to find out the answers to all these questions. And I just learned and built up my apologetics week by week by week by week. But I hadn't gone polemical yet. Because I really didn't know where. They're. How do you go polemical? Where do you get the material? There's no book that teaches you. There's no school that you can. Isn't it? Be isn't part it of. astonishing? I mean, that it's, you know, as you say, will will in 30 years be the largest religion in the world, and yet there's almost no Christian preparatory material on this stuff. But anyway, continue. and the reason why is because they don't want you to go polemical in your seminaries and your Bible schools, because you get death threats. Yeah. So this is the only religion that will kill you for what you say. The atheists aren't going to kill you. They're not even going to threaten you. They're going to sit there no, and laugh just, at you. They just try to, to sue you. That's right. Or they'll har harass you. Or yeah, they'll, exactly. They'll, they'll ad use ad hominem, but that's about it as far as they go. The Muslims will kill you, and you can see this with Salman Rushdie. Look, at they're still trying to kill him just for writing one book. So you can see either Taslina Nareen, Fazlur Rahman, all of them, they have been either had death threats or they have been killed. 
There's such a whole list of people who've been killed for nothing more than saying, being critical. The C-295 law in Pakistan, if you criticize the Prophet Muhammad or you criticize the Quran, it's a capital offense. So you can see coming out of this environment why they will not, they will not allow you to do any criticism. So polemics is not taught for that, very, for that very good reason. It was in 1994, I was down there and I had, I, I, um, I was not on the ladder, I was always on the ground, but I was 1994, I was in the middle of a crowd, there was a Trinidadian guy, Abu Sufyan was his name, he was a convert to Islam, he was up on the ladder, he had been a professional boxer, and he had a, his dali base around him, and I was trying to confront him with some material, I can't remember what it was, he came off the ladder, came down, and he just slammed me. And I went, I was out cold. Uh, I don't remember what happened next. The police came. When I came to, there was police around me, and they had pulled me out. And what they had told me is that there were about 60 Muslims start kicking me, and I went unconscious up from almost immediately. But I, he says, they, they said, then a big black man came and laid on top of me and took the blows for me. By the time they pulled me out then, I was bruised and battered. And when I came to, and I said, well, where is he? Let me thank him. He disappeared. That's Barry, my black angel. And he's, he's, uh, he's, been, he's helped me a number of times. But hold on, just that's back in 1994 this happened. And the police were very concerned because they said, it's just a matter of time before they kill you if this continues. So you're to get on a ladder, Mr. Smith. You're to get your own ladder. Now, we're not taught how to get on ladders in seminary. You're not taught how to do that in homiletics. And you're certainly not taught in how to take on harassment of that nature. So I had no way, no, nothing really to help me or to, to give me some preparatory material to really work in that type of environment. I did not want to get on a ladder, but I had to. Police demanded it. So I got a little kitchen ladder, got up, and it scared me to death. I had you up on a ladder, and you didn't feel too uncomfortable. You did feel a little uncomfortable the first time we went up. But I started doing this in 1994, and what happened was... 1995, excuse me, what happened was as I was learning to do polemics, I was taking a course at University of London at the School of Orient and African Studies by Gerald Hotting. Dr. Gerald Hotting using new material that was coming down the pipe called historical criticism. You've heard about it. Yeah. Asking simple questions like, how can you have this beautiful structure called the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, one of the nicest structures of, the, uh, of, of its day, the third most holy shrine in Islam, and yet it has no Qibla. Qibla means direction of prayer, as all mosques. You're supposed to have a direction of prayer. No Qibla whatsoever. And why is it we can't find any mosque anywhere in the 7th century that's facing Mecca? They're all facing north, more than likely Jerusalem. Questions like that. Why is it we can't find any reference to a man named Muhammad at all from any sources south of Tabuk? In other words, in Central Arabia. In fact, we can't find any Quran, any manuscript at all for any Quran in the 7th century. Well, these were questions I never heard about before. And I wanted to find answers. So I started taking them down to Speaker's Corner, asking these kind of questions at Speaker's Corner, getting up on the ladder. And I got a huge backlash, enormous backlash. I got beat up. I got thrown off the ladder. You can see where they try to open up my throat here. Uh, they, I, a number of my... I, it yeah, was, tell, that, tell that story what happened where they tried to cut <clears> your throat. I don't want to tell that story. Okay. I want to tell another story, because this is what really this is what really underlines what's happening. I was on a ladder. You guys once. need to ask him at lunch that story. It's a good story. <clears throat> I was on a. I was on a. There was a guy named Muhammad, and his like many of them are named, and he was about six foot seven. He was on the ground, so his face was right next to mine when he was standing on the ground. And I was going on about Muhammad, and at that time I was going through the traditions on Muhammad, going back to the source material on his life, what he did, uh, what he said, things like that, and just trashing him because of, of his, the fact that he's just not relevant for the, for the 21st century. And this Muhammad just grabbed me and threw me off the ladder, and I went flying. I went this way, my glasses went this way. Got back up, put my glasses back on, got, got on the ladder again, and started again. Three minutes later, he grabs me and throws me that way. And I brushed myself off, got back on the ladder, started a third time, and right again, he grabbed me, and he just threw me to the ground. And, it, you know, it's painful to fall to the ground. And I was bruised, I was cutting up. As I was about ready to get back on the ladder again, this Irish fellow who's an atheist, well-known atheist down there, comes up to the two of us and says, why are you two talking to each other? It's obvious you hate each other. Muhammad put his arm around me, turned towards the Irish man, 
He says, this man believes in God. I believe in God. You don't. <laughs> this man believes in heaven and hell. I believe in heaven and hell. You don't. This man is my brother. Who are you? That said it right there. Here is a guy who had thrown me off the ladder three times, yet called me his brother. And for the rest of the world who doesn't understand what's going on here, this is something that, that where the penny drops for me. You can shut down their arguments. In fact, you better start shutting down their arguments. You, can be a, you need to be just as passionate as they are. And you better know your material as well as they know their material. They don't hate you. It's the material that they hate. They're attacking you, not because of who you are. They're attacking you because of what you're saying. And there's what you're saying, there's no way to defend it except to shut you up. Well, I recall you telling me years ago that Muslims make wonderful converts if you can survive their conversion. <laughs> <laughs> because they go through such a process of anger at their realization that their faith is based on falsehoods. And, then once and as you're revealing that to them, they might become very, very violent as a result of that. But once the conversion is done, it's a, it's a Pauline kind of conversion. It's, it's, a, it's a, a change of 180 degrees. They're ready to go and die. Yeah, they're going 180 degrees against you. Yes. You, you shut that down, and they're going 180 80 degrees with you. Yes. And they, you can't stop them. I mean, they're the best converts I have found just because they already have the contacts, they have the relationships, they know the languages, they look like Muslims, they speak, act, talk, eat, do everything they can like Muslims, and they can interpret it so much better in that context. I just came back um, from yesterday, Bead with Hatun Tosh. You know that name. Yeah, I do. Hatun yes. Tosh is quite a... Very powerful She is a spokesperson a, for the faith. Yeah, she's a Saul who's become Paul. You know, we're looking for Sauls to become Paul. Well, here's a Sauline who's become a Pauline. And she epitomizes exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. she, is as, she is as forthright as anybody I've ever met. She tell, tell them a little bit about her. She's, she's an amazing person. I mean, she's had, uh, she's, she, they, they've hanged her. They've tried to hang her. She's, she she's kept, been she's stabbed. A Turkish, she's only five foot two. She's from Turkey. Her father is a well-known imam there in Turkey. And uh, she is the brightest one in her family. She has three brothers. I can't tell you too much more. I'm not permitted to tell you there's what happened. Uh, I can tell you when, when she was, because of the fact that she's so bright, she went to university and read the Gospel of John. And by reading that Gospel, uh, she gave her life to Jesus. Well, she didn't give her, she wouldn't become a Christian at the time. She just fell in love with Jesus. Well, who wouldn't after reading the Gospel of John? Told her father, and I'm not, I'm not permitted to tell you what happened next, but they had to get her out of Turkey real quick. Uh, her uncle got her out. And so she came to England, and that's where she became my student. Thought I was arrogant because of the, because of the way I talked, like you were both kind of sound like you were arrogant, and uh, I was teaching there at Oxford at at, at o o Oka Oxford Center of Christian Apologetics, Been but there I did many say, ours in the old ours yeah. in place. Yeah. But I was saying to her that you know, and to the students there that I'm at Speaker's Corner every Sunday. So she came the next Sunday to check it out and never stopped coming. She loved Speaker's Corner because it fit her mentality, it fit her cultural grid, and she would come up. And, and, and I remember when I first got to know her and she started coming on our team and we finally then employed her, I, I would tell her just to read the, uh, the book of Acts to find out what kind of methodology she wanted to use. So she started doing what Paul did, going into synagogues and invited, but he would, she would go into the mosques uninvited, like Paul did in Berea, Cappadocia, Laodicea, Ephesus. He always went to the synagogues first went right into where the Pharisees were and, sh and confronted them with what they had done to the Messiah. Well, she said, well, let's do the same thing in the mosques. Now, she wouldn't go with anybody else. She would go by herself. And uh, she would carry a bag with a bunch of Qurans in it. But each Quran that she had in there was different. They were all in Arabic. No two are alike. She found these Qurans. These are called Qirats. These are known as Ahruf, which uh, if you're an academic, you understand this. But Muslims on the ground don't know this. And then she'd just open them up and show them to the imams. Well, of course, they'd get upset and they'd throw her out. So she'd come back the next week, second time. They'd get upset again, they'd throw her out. By the third time, they finally had to less, uh, acquiesce and listen to her. And she's been into about 400 of these mosques all over London. As a Turk, these are Bangladeshi and Pakistani and Indian mosques. They're not, they're not Turkish mosques at all. And she has brought over 1,000 Muslims to Jesus Christ by doing this tactic. Now, this is polemics. This is not apologetic. She's not making friendships here. 
She's not going and trying to find out what, they're, what they have in common. She doesn't do any of that. She shuts down the Quran in one fell swoop every time she opens her mouth. Well, that's caused an awful lot of, uh, of anger amongst the Muslim community there in Britain. And so she was in a mosque in 2016, and um, I didn't know that she was in this mosque because I can't keep track of their schedule because she's got, she, she only sleeps four nights a week, so she could be up all night, many of the nights, just studying, studying, getting ready for the next, for the next day. She came into Sunday into the workshop. We have a workshop before we go down to Speaker's Corner uh, there at All Souls in Langham Place. And uh, she came in on crutches, and she had a neck brace on. and She was sweating profusely, and she had a bandage, and she had cast on her foot. And I said, Hutton, what in the world happened? She said, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I said, Hutton, you go right back to the hospital. You're sweating profusely. You need to get, you shouldn't have checked yourself out of the hospital. She says, no, we're getting up on the ladder. She had to get up on the ladder. I said, you need to tell me what happened. Here she'd been in a, in a mosque in Slough, just outside of London, near the airport. <clears throat> and uh, she had opened up the, these Qurans. And five of the Muslim men jumped her, grabbed her, started beating her up, broke her foot, broke her ribs, took her outside, put a rope over a tree, and we're going to hang her. And they had the rope around her neck, and we're in the process of hanging her when she was able to get her hand into her pocket. Now, in London, you can't use, uh, you can't use um, any type of rape, uh, what do you call these, these sprays? You have uh, to, mace. You can't use mace or anything. We don't have those in Britain. That's illegal. So she has a rape alarm, and she was able to push that. And some men next door, I think they were Polish, heard it, came running out, and they grabbed the guys, and they saved her life. But almost broke her neck by that time, and that's why she had a neck brace on. And yes, she wanted to get up on the ladder that day, and she did. And if you look at in Fander Films, which is my YouTube channel, if you go up on Fander Films, you can see that she, for the next three weeks, six weeks, I'm sorry, she That's has a neck break. That's P-F-A-N-D-E-R, Fander Films. The Fander Friends, yeah, we can put it there just like it. That's the YouTube channel where we put, and we would record all these, these uh, and great engagements that she had because she's, <clears throat> she is... Uh, has been arrested now four times by the police there at Speaker's Corner. Every time she gets arrested, it's the Muslims who get her arrested. The police then have had to then pay her. She, they, they've given her 10,000 pounds. There's another one. They'll have to have, it looks like they're going to have to give her 25,000 pounds. She doesn't keep a cent of it. She gives it right to her, the lawyers, the Christian concern that goes to court for her. Because they've been, every time she's been arrested, it's been illegal. You can't get arrested for talking about Islam in confronting the Quran at Speaker's Corner. It's the bastion of freedom of speech. Am I correct? Yeah. Has been for 200 years. There are only two laws at Speaker's Corner. You cannot slag off the queen, and you cannot use violence. Both are broken every week, but not by us, always by the Muslims. And yet yeah. she's the one that gets arrested. <clears throat> uh, two years ago, she was down at Speaker's Corner. It was raining, and it's all on film. You can go up on Fander Films, you can see it. A guy comes up and starts stabbing her with a knife full thrust on her head and broke off the knife on her forehead. She collapses to the ground. <clears throat> She's out. The police car that's right there, maybe a hundred feet away, puts a siren and goes shooting out after the guy who runs. They never catch him, which is typical in England because if you don't have guns, you're not going to catch anybody. You have to run after them. and These guys are all overweight anyways. So she falls to the ground. She's out for about 10 minutes. And cameras are on her. People are blood everywhere. After 10 minutes, she comes, she comes to. She stands up, blood streaming down her face. It's all on Fander Films. You can go see it. She turns to the crowd and says, You Muslims, your God needs you to kill me. My God doesn't need me to kill you. My God doesn't even need me. You can, I can die, and you're not going to hurt the word of God. While blood streaming by, she had the presence to continue preaching like she never stopped. Now, that's the caliber of the woman we're talking about. And she came back the next week, and she came back. She hasn't stopped coming back, even though she's been stabbed now. But here's the question I ask. Why wasn't she killed? If you look at the vi video, those thrusts should have, they should have, they had gone right through her head, I mean, gone right into the neck. Why was she killed? Well, <clears throat> I was in the Speaker's Corner, oh, maybe about 15 years ago when a Muslim was sent from uh, Toronto, Shabir Ali's disciple, 
to come to find a wife in London. He said, when you're there in London, make sure you see Jay Smith, good friend of, uh, I'm a good friend of Sh Dr. Shabbat Ali, probably the world's leading Muslim deb debater. His name was Mubin. He was in the crowd, and he wanted to talk to me afterwards. And so we went to a restaurant, and his hand was shaking like this. And he would not look at me. He, looked at me. he kept on looking away. I could see something was wrong with him. So I sat down at the table, and a bunch of us were there talking. And I turned to Mubin. I said, Mubin, what's wrong? You're, you seem very nervous. And he said, well, didn't you see them? I said, I, didn't I see what? The two men in the trees. I said, what two men are you talking about? There's these big oak trees. You've been there. They, we, have these, yeah. and we always try to stand underneath them to shade off from the sun. And he said, well, you must have seen them, Mr. Smith. I said, no, I'm not. Tell me, describe who these two men were. He said, well, there are two men sitting in the branch above you, and they're dressed in white, and they were smiling. You must have seen them, Mr. Smith. And I started laughing. And I said, Mubin, let me tell you what you saw. I said, when I get up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because we have to get there when the Muslims are at their strongest, and I'm on the ladder, there's about 20 or 30 churches here in the United States who are just starting their worship service five hours later, and they're praying for me, and they're praying for my, uh, that I get the gospel preached, and they're praying that what I say will convict the Muslims that are there, and they're also praying for my safety. You saw the answer to their prayers. But I have never, I've been there for 25 years at Speaker's Corner. I have never seen any angels. These are angels that are up on the branch. And I call them Harry and Larry. <laughs> so that's Harry and Larry up there. And, and then that's Barry on the ground. Well, I believe, and when I left, I said to Hatun, I'm leaving Harry and Barry with you. Harry, Larry, and Barry, you're getting all three of them. I don't need them anymore. You need them. That was why she was, she was protected. Because I've seen that video, and there's no way she should have been able to, to survive that. And that's why I say to anybody, if you go out and you do this kind of work for the Lord, he is going to protect you. We don't have to worry about this, Larry. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen to me. And I wish Americans and Europeans would stop being scared of Muslims. Well, and a, a major theme of this conversation is actually courage in proclaiming the truth of the gospel. And, um, you know, in recent podcasts, I've been, really been sort of pounding home this issue because most Americans, what, what we're talking about here is just so far outside of the realm of their own experience that it's just hard for them to imagine this. And um, I... Uh, I, well, but stop, I stop and ask, what, what look, I mean, look at Paul's ministry. Wasn't it much the same? Oh, he well, got beat up. Look at the twice, two times that they stoned him almost to death, yet he didn't and die. And the prophets and the other apostles. Uh, for sure, you know, it's very interesting. You'll recall when I was invited by Al Jazeera America to debate um, Zaid Shakir um, on their network. And Al Jazeera America doesn't exist anymore, but their domestic audience was only about 15,000. They're funded out of Doha. Um, and um, interesting, I had written a piece in USA Today that had gone viral uh, comparing Christianity and Islam and the violence of Islam with, uh, with that of, um, of Christianity. And so they invite me to come in and do this debate and um, but they tell me that they're going to broadcast. Hey, you know our des domestic audience is huge, but we're going to broadcast across all of our platforms, which is a global audience of 260 million people. You know, Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera America, Al Jazeera Balkans, which you know that's where the radicals are. Yeah. So the next thing I know, I'm getting a call from some very prominent people, you know, from the Justice Department and elsewhere, who are saying, "Larry, do not do this." Do not do this. Jay Sekulow, you know, called me and said, uh, you know, you will be receiving threats um, to kill your family, to kill you. Uh, so and I was a little disappointed um, by the Christians who were telling me not to do this. Mm -hmm. And you may remember you were still in London at the time, and I called you and I said, hey, what do you think about this invitation? Should I do this? And you were the only guy who said, do it. Do it. You have a tremendous opportunity to proclaim the truth and encourage believers all over the world. Yeah, yeah. And the response, again, you know, on this side was, uh, it, truthfully, you know, from the Justice Department was, Larry, every AK-47-wielding terrorist in the world is going to see you. And um, I, But I thought to myself, I have so many brothers and sisters, Christian brothers and sisters in the third world who face this kind of persecution every day. How can I look them in the eye when I'm afraid to 
to be threatened. Mm. So I did that debate, and uh, and I think that the Lord really honored that, you know, quite powerfully. Uh, but I was so grateful for the fact that I was waiting for someone to say I was going to do it anyway. But I was waiting for that Christian to say I should do it. And you know, just about every Christian I was talking to was saying, "No, don't do that." I'm I'm very unsettled by the unwillingness of Western evangelicals to risk their comfort, much less risk their lives. I mean, is, is, is this your observation as well? Or are you, are you so in the weeds of guys who are like you that you just don't see this? No, I do see it. And, I, and this, you're bringing up an interesting point. I think we've become so comfortable here in the United States. And of course, we've seen what the Muslims have been doing around the world. <laughs> Well, we, we, were, we all know where we were when 9-11 happened. It, was, it shocked the entire world, and it shocked, uh, it shocked the Muslim world as well. The many Muslims I come across uh, still don't understand what happened in 9-11. They don't understand because they're not, they're not reading their scriptures. But here's what I always say whenever I go, because the first question whenever I go to a church, when I talk about what we're doing or what kind of work we're doing and the fact that I use apologetics and polemics. In fact, if anything, I'm more polemical than I am apologetical because I spent so much time confronting the Quran and Muhammad and Mecca, those three areas. The first question is, well, aren't you afraid of your security? Aren't you afraid of your, for your life? And I always take him back to Matthew 10. This is the commissioning of the 12 disciples. Yeah, the words will be given to you. And this is what uh, Jesus said to the disciples. I'm yeah. sending you out as lamb before wolves. If you preach in my name, you're going to be hated. And I look at the crowd and I say, how many of you have been hated for Christ's name here in America? If you preach in my name, you're going to be persecuted. How many of you have been persecuted for my name? If you preach in my name, you're going to be jailed. You're going to be whipped. How many of you have been jailed or whipped? And then number five, if you preach in my name, you will be killed. Those are the five things he promises them. Check me out. See if I'm right. Matthew 10. Five things he promises the, uh, the 12 disciples. And then he says in verse 34, For I have not come to bring peace. I've come to bring the sword to set father against son and mother against uh, daughter. This is a sword that we don't use. This is a sword that's going to be wielded against us by our own family. That's the promise he gives. Verse 38, for he who's not willing to bear my cross is not worthy to be my disciple. That's the commissioning of the 12. Every one of the disciples was hated. They were persecuted. They were all put in jail. They were all flogged. And every disciple except for John was killed. They all received their commissioning. Well, if that's their commissioning, shouldn't it be our commissioning just as well? Why do we have such a fear of being hated or persecuted, let alone being hurt? And that's why it's lovely working with people like Al-Fadi, who is from Saudi Arabia. I do most of my work with him. I work with Hatun. I was just with her yesterday. We work together hand and foot. Uh, she's over here in the United States right now. But every time I come to London, I get back up on the ladder with her. Uh, because they don't have this fear that Americans have. They come out of a Muslim background. It and takes practice. I mean, if you're somebody who's listening to this and going, I could never do that, you can do that, but it takes some practice. You don't have to start by risking your life, but you can. You just start by sharing your faith with your neighbor over the backyard fence or you know, your colleague at the water cooler. You start somewhere well, and let me push just say that, a little beyond your comfort level. Larry, I always say this to everybody here in America. Remember, there's two. we're, we're talking about two different categories, apologetics and polemics. Yes. Two different, it's like a football team. You have your offense and you have your defense. Two completely different teams, right? They're not on the field at the same time. And they have completely different skills. So if you're an apologist defending the faith, you better know the Bible pretty well and you better know Jesus Christ pretty well. And Those that's the two everyone's things. calling, whereas polemics isn't there everyone's you go. calling. If you're going to be polemics, however, you're going to have to know, in case of Islamic polemics, you better know the Quran and you better know <laughs> Muhammad. And those two areas, and not many people know those two areas, but you don't teach them in our seminaries. That's why we've started the MAPI program, MAPI, Master of Arts in Apologetics and Polemics to Islam, just to fill this niche, because there's not one school in the world that teaches apologetics and polemics except for us. Well, and we're going to get into some of those things, and we're actually doing a two-part you know, podcast, and uh, we're going to get into some of, some of those details. You know, I, I think it's fascinating. At the end of World War II, do you know how many... Russian experts there were in the State Department. <clears throat> One. Are you serious? Yeah. Isn't that incredible that 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 the the United States was so ill prepared for the Cold War that there was only one Russian expert in the State Department. Of course, there would be buildings full of them 
you know, by the end of the Cold War and uh, the United States to prepare for and, you know, to get their citizens, uh, um, you know, ready uh, for, you know, all that might be coming. You had a, a um, just an avalanche of Russian information, you know, that was dumped on the American people post-World War II. Uh, I was taught a lot of Russian history in high school. You know, we were taught so much about the, you know, what Marxism and socialism, these kinds of issues. Um, I, there was a, um, a, a major push for science, you know, to compete mm. with the Russians after Sputnik went up and, you know, 57, all these kinds of things. And by the, you know, the end of, of the Cold War in the, the early 90s, some would say it has never ended, but that's another subject. You have, you have untold number of, of experts on Russia and PhDs on, on Russian history and salt talks and Cold War and all these things in universities. We still don't have it in where Islam is concerned. It's like it's completely ignored. No one seems to be particularly interested. I even found that before 9-11, when I would speak to this issue, uh, audiences were kind of eh, not particularly interested uh, in hearing about Islam. Now, after 9-11, that changed, but it changed only briefly. Mm -hmm. It changed for a few years, and you know, a room might be full of people. I mean, you experienced when you came to Birmingham, there just wasn't a ton of interest in hearing right. about Islam. And yet it is, yeah. Well, here's what's interesting. Look at the two of us sitting right here. You're really a prophet for today on what's happening with woke and LGBTism, and everything else that's going on because the whole Marxist in, in, uh, infrastructure that's coming to the United States, because you're a historian in that very area. And that's why Tom has brought you in to kneel it down and bring it down to the sources. You're going back to the source for all of, of where it's all coming from. It's been, it's been percolating for years. It's just we're now seeing Decades, the result of it. Centuries. Whereas in my case, I always go to the sources as well. Most people have no idea what's happening in Islam. They have no idea what 9-11 what was all about. They don't understand what all these jihadis, the Boko Haram and the Al-Qaeda and the, and the uh, ISIS, they don't even know where ISIS came from or what is, why it became so strong in the world stage. In order to understand these groups, you need to go right back to the very beginning. You need to go back to the source. Now, you do that with Marxism. I do that with Islam. That's something we're going to be doing in these talks. Because to really understand really what's happening, to see what's, where Islam is going, to know what's going to happen in the next 30 years when they will be the largest religion on earth, we better know, we better get to know what is it that motivates them and where these radical groups, and these, it's the radical Muslims who are by far the most exciting. And it's the radical Muslims that I work with. And is it, when we're saying radicals, we really mean orthodox, don't we? Well, radical number means the, the root number. You go back to the root. Yeah. They are the root. And if you want to know what a radicalist Muslim is, all you need to do is open up this book. You just need to open up the Quran. Radicalism is right through this book. And I'll show you verse after verse after verse that supports exactly what they're saying, which means they're doing the same thing we do. We're radical Christians because we go back to this book. And you notice it's the bigger book. I keep it bigger for a reason. <laughs> so we go back to both of us, go back to two different books. But what a difference in these two books. And that's something we're going to do later. But can you see then why it's important that we go back to the root? to find out what motivates them and what will continue to motivate them because this book isn't changing. This book still is there and they're still reading it. We're not reading it. So that's why we don't know what their, what their motivation is. All right, let's talk a little bit about, I, I want to transition to talk a little bit about, you know, and when we're thinking about this issue of courage, let's talk a little bit about Nigeria. <laughs> You're, um, you've had some, I've been there, I've seen much of the terror that has gone on in that country, um, the Fulani Herdsman Militia, Boko Haram, both uh, Muslim militant sects that are slaughtering Christians in that country. You've, you've been all over Africa, and yet Nigeria is very different. Explain to people what's happening there. <laughs> Nigeria. I promise I'd never go back to Nigeria. I've been there about three or four times, and every time there have been, I've seen violence. And it, it, it stands to, you, 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 you fly into Lagos and you get, go from the airport. As soon as you're out of the airport, you don't see white people anywhere. And that, you do all over Africa. All over Africa. In every major city, you see white people. They're the Chai Dukans. They're, you know, they're walking down the road, going, they're in malls. But you don't see them. 
in, 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 uh, in Lagos, I just didn't see anybody, any white people walking on the streets. I couldn't figure out what was going on. This just didn't look right. And I'd spent five years in Senegal, West Africa, where we would go into town all the time and we'd walk, we'd walk everywhere out in the open, not a problem. So this, uh, this was odd to me. It didn't take me long to see what was going on. And it was uh, the first night I was there. This is a few, li well, I've been to Africa, for, I've been to Nigeria for a number of different places. I was one place I, I was brought to was uh, Port Harcourt uh, with uh, Archbishop Akinola. He flew me in to talk to his 800 cannons and he wanted me to get up to a cathedral. And I was met by a car with two guards, both carrying AK 47s. And I thought that was rather surprising. I've never had that kind of, that kind of assistance before. In every uh, police block that we had, which is about every five kilometers, they would just look in the car, saw that I was a white guy, and they just flagged us right on. So it was a great, easy to get through. The next day, uh, Dr. Patrick Sogdale came in. He was an Indian. He's a good colleague of mine, a good friend from Britain. He was flown in to also do some talks. And when they met him, they just met him in a car with no guards. And he got stopped everywhere. It took him a lot longer to get up to the cathedral. And he was furious. And he says, why do you give a guard to Jay, but you don't give one to me? And they said, because you're Indian. No one's going to kidnap you. But Jay, he's white. And they're going to start cutting one finger off a day. And they're going to send us a finger. We're going to get a finger, then another finger, then 10 fingers, then it starts the nose and the ears. And then after that comes the body. And if we don't pay $22 million for him, we don't see him again. That's why we have to have the guards there. Now, I, they didn't tell me this before I came. I wish they would have. I probably <laughs> would have asked them to come to me rather than me go up to the cathedral. But that was, that was back there in a number of, quite a number of years ago. What, what, what I find with Nigeria is that you see, I, we went up to Jos, and I'm going to be going, and I don't want to say what's happening to Lape, so I Yeah, I've, I've up. been there. I'm going to go. We, we went Preached to Jos. the cathedral there. And uh, we were... We, they had us actually teach outside of Jos, and they, we had to go out to a, a building that was out in the desert that was created for that purpose. And the students they brought to me were people from all over Nigeria. And all the ones who'd come from northern Nigeria, they had machete wounds on them, scars. And they weren't open wounds now. They Very healed, common. But they had on their head and on their back, and yet they're going back up there again. I couldn't believe it. One woman who was in our class, she had been up in Mauritania, and she had been there the first week that she was there. She was taken by the police, taken into the prison, and was raped by multiple men. And yet she went out and still keep preaching, kept preaching the gospel. That didn't shut her up. And she was planning to go back again, and she wanted this new material, all this new polemics to use there. So it's a different culture. It's a different environment. I've never seen this kind of... Violence. This is your scale of it. That, that's it. I've seen violence. I've heard about it in other parts of Africa, but nothing on, that you see the, in Nigeria. And you're, you've had the same situation when you're up in Jos, and you went north of Jos. Yes, so. um, very much so. And, you know, I, I, I want to address this for a couple of reasons because um, according to Spectator, they did a beautiful article on this. It's been some years ago, and the, I'm sure the numbers haven't really changed much, but uh, Spectator in Britain uh, had a beautiful piece titled The um, Unreported Catastrophe of Our Time and how 100,000 Christians a year are killed in what they call a situation of witness, meaning for their faith, not in automobile accidents or from cancer, but specifically targeted for their faith. And um, <clears throat> going from memory here, but if I've done the math right, that works out to 11 Christians per hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, yeah. who are killed for their faith. And it's, as they point out, it's unreported. It is a, it is a global holocaust that no one really is paying attention to. And what I thought was kind of interesting was um, in Nigeria, the Christians at the time when, when I was there, which was in, I think, 2017, um, they loved Trump. And it was because Trump was willing to say what no American president in memory had said, and that is that Islam is a religion of violence. There are three, there are three major areas of violence in Africa. One is Nigeria with the Boko Haram, and it's the Boko Haram that's really pushing it there. The other one is, in, is in, uh, over in Somalia with the Al-Shabaab. Mm -hmm. The Al-Shabaab who come into Kenya, and what they do is they stop buses, 
And then they have everybody in the bus do the shahada. And if they cannot do the shahada, they kill them on the spot. Yeah. That's all you need to say. As long as you can say that, you're going to survive. But they, 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 just, they just shoot people right off the, right off the bat. Uh, then the other place would be that's what's happening now in Chad and uh, Burkina Faso with ISIS. So ISIS has now moved down into the northwestern. But notice, these are all Muslim enclaves. These are strong Muslim enclaves. And they're all in the north. And they're wanting to push that side. And they're moving site. south. They're they want what south. they call push the Muslim line. And the Muslim line is, 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 there's no, it's imaginary line, but if you look and see where the populations of Islam are now increasing in Africa, it's moving about three to six kilometers a year further south. And the way they're year. doing it, um, all over Africa is you will hear the uh, Christians, you'll see, hear the Africans telling the stories of, you know, truckloads of kids are brought into the city, you know, the you know, Muslim man, four wives, he might have 50 or 100 children. And um, they bring these uh, children into these these uh, non-Islamic you know areas, dump these kids off at some crossroads somewhere. People begin noticing why are all these orphan kids running all over our our town, begging, selling trinkets, things of this nature. And then a Muslim cleric is sent in, usually funded by the Saudis, <clears throat> who then begins to instruct these kids in Islam. And eventually, they're armed with AK-47s. And mm -hmm. those kids, by this time, they've been there for a couple of years. This happened in Nigeria, 2010, 2012, somewhere in there in the, the more Christian south. And uh, they would just say, hey, show us where the vicar lives. And they would go and, and uh, they'd lead them, you know, where to, who to kill, who to target. Because these children, by this time, would know their way all over the villages, mm -hmm. all over the towns. And they're just slaughtering people and this is the way they this is mostly a tactic of the fulani herdsmen uh which they've done boko haram has done this the cathedral where i was speaking had been bombed and um <laughs> again something would be very unnerving you know to westerners hard for them to imagine the day that i was speaking at the cathedral uh, in jaws the muslims had 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 surrounded the cathedral and are sitting on the walls you know there's a I don't know, maybe a four or five foot wall that is around the uh, the church. Not enough to prevent people from getting over, but to give, prevent a car bomb. You know, somebody driving, you know, into the church, and um, they're all sitting on the walls. You know, looking in. You know, through the windows. You know, watching what's going on there, partially from fascination because it was as if I was the only white man in you know that part of that part of Africa, but also to intimidate to frighten people from coming to church. And it's it, it's somewhat effective because many of the Christians won't go to church because they don't want to push through those Muslim crowds in order to get to their church. And this is what has changed, particularly in Jaws, because these used to be Christian enclaves, but now the Muslims have kind of taken them over. And so this church, which used to be surrounded by people who are of the Christian faith, now, now these sections are... Are, are, mm. are run by Muslims. Mm. And uh, so this is going on in a, on a very large scale, and the government is doing very little about it. And not only that, but when the Christians push back, when they have armed themselves and sought to defend themselves, you have the UN you know, declare that this is a human rights violation, the government come in and disarm them. It's, uh, uh, there's been several instances where the churches in Nigeria might be having a gathering, and um, the police somehow magically disappear just mm. before a Fulani or a Boko Haram attack, and uh, the government, you know, pretends ignorance. But just the sheer scale of the violence in, in in that country, and I know that there are people who will be listening to this, some of whom are Nigerians, and who will in the comments say, "This is not true. I live in Nigeria. These things don't happen." Uh, to, to which I say two things. First of all, simply because you've swam across the Limpopo River and weren't consumed by crocodiles doesn't mean there aren't crocodiles in the water. So I do have people who say, oh, I've been on some of those roads, never had any problem. Okay, well, perhaps you got lucky. Second, we both know that often the Nigerians themselves, because these are threats that they live with, they don't understand, many of them, some do, but they don't understand the dangers that, say, a white man, you know, when, when you when you're in Nigeria, that you're exposed to. Yeah, you are targeted, and that's unfortunately, and a lot of it, what I was told, it's nothing to do with the church. It has to do with oil. 
Uh, it started with the oil barons, the, the oil engineers. Richest who would country in, in Africa, yep. largest country in Africa, and if that's, most populous country. And they Africa. assume, therefore, we all have lots and lots of money. And that's why we're a liability there for that reason. But nonetheless, there... You know, we, I, I don't want to get, inst- get people thinking that this is, this is symptomatic of Islam all over the world. It's not. Uh, it, it, this is unique to, well, and, yes, to Nigeria. And, and that, that's kind of the point, is that the experience there is quite unique. It's so unique. We, I haven't had this problem when I'm in Ethiopia, engaging with Muslims there, or we lived in, for five years in Senegal, which is 97% Islamic. All our neighbors were Muslim. We never had this problem. There was no violence whatsoever that we could see uh, in w- Western Africa outside of of Ni- Nigeria seems to be unique. The other part, as I said earlier, is uh, if what you see in Somalia and what you're seeing in northern Kenya. Again, Islamic part of Kenya. And now what's coming into, and this is something new that's coming uh, into Boko, Burkina Faso, uh, into Chad, those countries. Uh, they, it's sad to see that it's coming, in, and that's it, this is ISIS. And the French are the ones who are having to deal with it. They're sending in French soldiers to try to shut that down. I don't know if they're going to be successful or not. But at some point, people are going to have to ask, why is it that we keep on seeing these groups pop up all over the world? Where did ISIS come from? Where did this Al-Qaeda come from? Uh, where does Boko Haram? Where does Al-Shabaab? Because they're all saying the same thing. And yet they come from totally different environments. They come from totally different cultural backgrounds. And they certainly come from different political situations. Yet they all seem to be speaking from the same page. No one's listening to what they're saying. We've got to do that at some point. You and I can do that. Well, to close out on a theme about courage, uh, you've been in uh, uh, circumstances that are quite dangerous, and yet you're willing to go back to a place like Nigeria. Why would you be willing to do that? Well, I have Harry, Larry, and Barry to to protect (laughs) me, of course. No, I'm being facetious. You have to go back because because the Lord, Lord is still working there, and they need us to go back. And they, more than that, I think they need to make sure, they need to see that we go back. Now, in my case, I'll be going back to Nigeria, I'll be going back to these places because uh, there, I have students who are there, they're, they're, they're going to invite me, I'm going to be uh, participating and also training them up because they need to use this new material. So I have to be there because I have to have that contact face-to-face. It's, it's great to have the Zoom uh, webinars, which uh, we've been doing since 2013, and we do... We've been using Zoom long before most people knew that it existed because we can get into these countries. They don't have to come to us. They don't need to get visas or, or get airfares, stay in hotels. We go to them, and we're there every Monday night. Now I need to be there to see them, to actually engage with them, to be able to get their questions and answers, and to see a much larger scale. But they need to see us there. They need to see that we're not I staying agree with away. That. They need to make sure that we are, that we're willing to participate in the same dangers that they're participating in, albeit because of the fact that we are white, we become magnets to, for violence, unfortunately. And so that puts them in danger as well. So there is that, that that we have to weigh up one against the other, but it is important that we do go and not just talk about it, but we actually participate in it. I don't see anywhere in the New Testament where Paul didn't, did not go. Paul, when he got beat up, he just brushed himself off and went to the next place, knowing that he would probably get beat up again. And that never stopped him. And that never stopped him, mainly because... He was doing what Christ commissioned in Matthew 10. And if it's the commission that we should expect to be hated and persecuted, possibly even beat up, maybe killed, then if it was good enough for them in the first century, it's good enough for me in the 21st century. So then what do you say to somebody who's listening to this? Is not gonna, they're not going to be in Nigeria. They're not going to be in Somalia. They're not going to be in those places. They're just nervous about, you know, they're uh, uncertain about how to share their faith in this country. All right. And, and I would say to them, listen, absolutely don't. This is not your calling. This is not your gifting. God's not going to place you in those type of environments. Let us do that. That's our calling. We're trained to do that. I, uh, I'm training up the whole MAPI program. We have about 200 students now. They are all being trained to actually confront on these issues on at this level. And there, we're training them by Zoom webinar on Monday nights. They're all over the world, and they're already in situ. They're where the Muslims are. So they need to be trained up on that, how to confront that. But the people sitting at home, most Americans who will not see that many Muslims in their life, they may see them at school, maybe at work, possibly on the streets, but rarely will they see Muslims in their own family. For those kind of people, you don't do the polemics. Let us do the polemics, do the apologetics, which means learn your Bible. Learn how to defend Jesus Christ. 
just be able to know how, what, how to defend and define the Trinity in two minutes or the divinity of Jesus. Where can you support that? And the questions that Muslims are going to have, they're great questions. How could God be on earth and on and in space simultaneously? Who, if there's one God there, there's one God here. Are you talking about two different gods? How do you defend that? How could God ever take on human form and enter time and space? God's omnipotent. How could he to be uh, the infinite, become finite? Can you answer that kind of question? How could one plus one plus one equal one? That make, it makes three in my mathematical equation. Answer those kind of questions. Because those are the kind of questions you're going to get. And they're easy to answer to use those answers and then to introduce the gospel through them. That's all that you're required to do. Just defend Jesus and defend the Bible because there are going to be lots of questions about the corruption of Scripture, uh, whether these historical anachronisms, this material that I had to learn real quickly by the seat of my pants, we can support them and we can actually get people up and running on how to answer those kind of questions. That's all God is calling you to do. Well, it's fantastic. In this podcast, I have a goal and it is to equip, encourage, and mobilize people. I don't, I don't want them to leave a podcast feeling defeated and overwhelmed that the world is an awful place where they yeah. are helpless to engage. I want them to feel empowered to engage. And so I hope people, you know, just hearing the stories of the things that you've done, uh, Hatoon, others, uh, their willingness to share the faith in spite of physical threats, death threats, um, physical harm that has been suffered, and yet continuing on anyway, that, that should encourage people here in this country to move forward and just being able to share their faith and maybe maybe suffer some, uh, you know, some, some nasty things being said about them on mm. social media or perhaps losing a friend or two or being ostracized. Jay, it's great to have you with me. Good to be here. Thank you.